speaker is uh, uh, he's a graduate student at Princeton with Nadi Cyber. Uh, he's going to talk about fractons on graphs and complexity. Uh, thanks, Arpit, uh, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. Uh, so today I'll be talking about fractons and graphs and complexity. Oh. This is. Oh. oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, fractons and graphs and complexity. So this is based on work that I've done with Hotat and Shuheng. Um, I might even tease a little bit about some upcoming work with uh, Hotat, Napi, and Shuheng. Okay, uh, let me start with, uh, yeah, some of the main characteristics of uh, fracton models. Uh, the first one, uh, the uh, most interesting one is the uh, exotic global symmetry, uh, which uh, where the symmetry acts on a subsystem rather than the entire system. Uh, and the second one is large ground state degeneracies, where the logarithm of the ground state degeneracy grows uh, with the linear size of the system. Uh, and uh, the most interesting one is the uh, existence of particle-like excitations with restricted mobility. Okay. However, like most of uh, these uh, exotic lattice models, including fracton models, are defined usually on a cubic lattice. Uh, uh, for type one fracton models, people have generalized this to foliated uh, manifolds, uh, but that still requires a structure of foliation of the manifold. Even type two fracton models, such as Harford and et cetera, are typically defined on a cubic lattice. The question I want to address is whether we can have uh, the phenomenology of fracton models on a graph like uh, exotic models on a general graph. Okay, today I'll discuss uh, two exotic lattice models. Uh, the first one is a matter theory based on, uh, which you can think of as a discretization of uh, the compact Lipschitz field theory, uh, where the, uh, the spatial derivative is replaced by the Laplacian. Okay, and the second model is a U1 gauge theory, uh, which can be thought of as a regularization of uh, a pure gauge theory of rank two U1 gauge views. Uh, where the temporal gauge field has a, a standard gauge symmetry, whereas the spatial gauge field has a Laplacian wave symmetry. Okay, let me get to the setup. Uh, so my spatial slice uh, is always a graph. It's a general graph. Uh, the edges are assumed to be undirected. There's no orientation. Uh, and I assume that uh, there is at most one edge between any two vertices, so it's simple. And I also assume that it's a connected graph. Like some of these assumptions can be dropped. It doesn't change the analysis much, but I'll just assume this for simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I assume that there are n vertices. And I work with uh, Euclidean signature. So my space-time lattice is uh, Euclidean, uh, where each spatial slice is this graph, and two adjacent spatial slices are connected by uh, the tau lengths. OK. The crucial role is played by the discrete Laplacian operator uh, on this graph. Uh, which is defined as follows. So f here is a function on the vertices of the graph, and the Laplacian of f is defined as follows. Uh, at a given vertex, take the sum of the values of f at the neighbors of this vertex minus the number of uh, neighbors times the value of the function of that vertex. So that's the definition of uh, Laplacian operator. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, a 1D chain, like a cycle graph, uh, it boils down to the uh, Typical in the standard second order difference of operator that everyone knows. Okay, th this is a good example to keep in mind whenever you're confused. So uh, I'll keep coming back to the uh, cycle graph throughout the talk. Okay, so this here's the outline. So let me uh, go ahead and start with the first model. So the model I'm interested in is uh, described with uh, this action here. It's an XY type model where you have a U1 variable at uh, every site in the lattice. And uh, there are two terms in the action. The first term is a standard XY type term, whereas the second term involves a Laplacian interaction instead of the usual spatial difference operator. Uh, since this model is interacting like a tip usual XY model, uh, I would instead work with uh, a modified villain model of the, uh, uh, it's a related model where you can recognize that the first line here uh, is a standard villain representation of an XY type model, okay? And the fields n tau and n here are integer villain gauge fields. What the second term here does is uh, we can should interpret phi tilde as a Lagrange multiplier that enforces the constraint that the villain gauge fields are flat. 
So physically, you should think of this as uh, suppressing the vortices in the system. If this were an XY model, this would be literally suppressing the vortices in the model. And the integer gate symmetry uh, in this model, uh, because of these integer gate fields, effectively turns these uh, fields phi and phi tilde into a compact field. Uh, because the original model that we started with had only compact variables, this is how the compactness comes out in this model. Let's look at the symmetries of this model. Okay, first, there is a, a, a shift symmetry where phi is shifted by a constant. Uh, this is well known even in a standard XY model, and it generates a U1 symmetry. More generally, you can shift phi uh, by an arbitrary function of the position uh, by appropriately shifting the integer gauge field n by the Laplacian of that function. Uh, this ensures that the second term in the action is invariant, and so the entire action itself is invariant. So this is a symmetry. However, there is a, a small issue. The n here has to be an integer. So the Laplacian of this function should also be an integer. It should better be an integer. Uh, we can reword this uh, as the Laplacian of f being 0 modulo 2 pi. This is exactly the definition of a u1 value discrete harmonic function. So it's a harmonic function on the graph, but it's u1 value. To give a concrete example, let's go back and look at the cycle graph. Uh, in this case, the discrete harmonic functions are given by, uh, take this form, uh, it's a constant plus a linear function in X, but the coefficient of the linear function uh, is quantized. It's it supposed, it, it, it's restricted to be an integer because of this integral equation. The constant here generates the standard U1 momentum symmetry, whereas the integer generates the Z and uh, symmetry. And since uh, the form here is a linear function in X, it's what is usually called the dipole symmetry. More generally, uh, for an arbitrary graph, uh, the symmetry takes the form U1 times uh, a finite abelian group known as the Jacobian group of the graph. Now, this already uh, uh, ties into some nice results in graph theory. So the exotic uh, symmetry in this model is related to a graph theoretic notion called the Jacobian group of the graph. There is also a winding symmetry which acts on the field phi, phi tilde, in the same way uh, that momentum symmetry acts on the field phi. And, and hence, the winding symmetry is also U1 times the Jacobian of the graph. This is to be expected. This is not accidental because there is a self duality in this uh, model which exchanges the fields phi and phi tilde and uh, also the coupling constants appropriately. Next, I want to look at the ground state degeneracy in this model. Uh, so, for concreteness, con consider this configuration where phi uh, is a discrete harmonic function uh, with NPs. Uh, and n is the Laplacian of this uh, uh, of this function. Clearly, this uh, configuration is not suppressed by this action. It just has zero action. In other words, it has zero energy. So the ground state degeneracy is equal to the number of such configurations, which is equal to the order of the Jacobian. It's a, rem remember that uh, Jacobian group is a finite abelian group, so it has a finite order. Right? In the example of a cycle graph, which is like a 1D chain, uh, the discrete harmonic functions without the constant piece are just these linear functions. And the number of values that P can take is N. So the ground state you can see there is N, which is also the order of the group C. Now, uh, you might wonder if uh, the energy of these configurations is lifted uh, because the, the way we computed was classical. Uh, you might wonder if it's lifted when you quantize the theory, but it's not because uh, the Jacobian momentum and the Jacobian winding symmetries do not commute with each other. Okay, so the entire Hilbert space is in a projective representation of this symmetry of, of, of the group uh, Jacobian of gamma. And that leads to the ground state degeneracy uh, of which is the order of the Jacobian group. Okay. Interestingly, uh, there is a, a well known theorem uh, in graph theory called this matrix tree theorem, which uh, implies that the order of the Jacobian group is also equal to the number of spanning trees in the graph. Uh, so here I uh, know what a spanning tree is. Uh, a spanning tree is a subgraph of the original graph, which spans all the vertices, but doesn't have any cycles or loops. For example, just here, span all the vertices in this graph, but they don't have any cycles, whereas the original graph had lots, lots of cycles. Now, the number of spanning trees is a very well-studied notion in graph theory. Uh, it's known as a complexity of the graph. Uh, it tells you how complex a graph is. Like the more the number of spanning trees, the more complicated the graph is. Uh, let's look at, uh, so hence the slogan, uh, the uh, ground state degeneracy uh, is equal to the complexity of the graph. Okay. Let's look at some class of graphs and uh, look at how the complexity scales with the number of vertices in the graph. 
So the first example is the tree, a graph being just a tree. In this case, the number of spanning trees is just one, it's the tree itself. Okay, there's nothing weird here. Next, we can look at a cycle graph where you can remove any or any one of the edges and you get a spanning tree. So there are n spanning trees. So the complexity here is n. And on the other extreme, you have a complete graph where you have an edge between any two pairs of vertices. And in this case, the number of spanning trees grows uh, as n to the n minus two. And that's like faster than exponential in n. More generally, uh, you can look at a k-regular graph where by k-regular, I mean every vertex has a degree k, meaning that it has k neighbors. And in this case, uh, when k is greater than or equal to three, uh, the complexity grows exponentially in n. Uh, as you might have guessed, this model is not robust uh, but because you can add some uh, winding operator to the action and it lifts the degeneracy because it's just huge degeneracy and it can be easily lifted. But there are related models that I won't be talking about today, uh, which are robust. So that's the first model. Uh, and then I want to move on to the U1 gauge theory. So the U1 gauge theory uh, here uh, is associated to the momentum symmetry of the previous model. So they have, I have two gauge fields. The temporal gauge field has a standard gauge symmetry and the spatial gauge field has a Laplacian gauge symmetry. There is also an integer gauge symmetry. Uh, effectively, its job is to make sure that these gauge fields are compact. Okay. And the action has uh, two kinds of terms. The first term is like a typical Maxwell type term. And the second term is a theta term. And the only gauge invariant field strength in this case is the electric field. So that's all we have. This, this is all we can learn. Let's look at the global symmetries in this mode. So first you have a space-like symmetry by which I mean it acts on the spatial gauge field. Uh, it shifts it by a constant circular value constant, so it's a U1 symmetry. And the object charged under this is the, the Wilson operator of uh, the spatial gauge field A, which is just the product of E to the IA and all the sites at a fixed time. More interestingly, there is also a time-like symmetry which acts on the temporal gauge field uh, and shifts it by a discrete value uh, discrete harmonic function and appropriately the interior gauge field. Uh, as we have seen before, again, this generates a U1 times Jacobian uh, symmetry and the object charged under the symmetry is the defect of eta extended in the time direction at a fixed uh, location. Now this defect can be interpreted uh, as the whole line of a pro particle uh, at the position I, uh, which carries a U1 charge one. Now time-like symmetry, in particular, the Jacobian part, which is the set of all position dependent functions, uh, restricts uh, the mobility of the particle. And the, uh, the way it does this uh, is as follows. The answer is this. A particle can move from a vertex I to another vertex I prime, if and only if all the given value discrete harmonic functions uh, on this graph take the same value at I and I prime. Okay, this is not a very useful characterization. It really doesn't tell you uh, what it means. But using the graph theoretic version of what is called the uh, abel jacobi map, uh, one can show that this condition is equivalent to uh, the statement that there is a unique path from I to I prime. So what this means is a particle can move from I to I prime if and only if there is a unique path between them. Let me demonstrate that for you uh, in an example. So here's a graph and there is a the red dot denotes a particle of charge one in this vertex. And there is a uh, unique path between these two vertices, which is given by the, just this edge here. So according to my claim, uh, this particle should be able to move to this uh, vertex here. Let me show how it does that. So first it hops to this vertex and leaves behind a dipole. So the red here means it's a positive charge and positive, positive end of the dipole and the blue is a negative charge end of the dipole. Now I can apply the operator E to the IA on this vertex and that moves the dipole from this edge to this edge. This is typically how it uh, works even in a, a, a dipole gauge theory. Next, I can apply the operator E to the IA on this vertex, and it kills the dipole on this edge and creates a dipole on these two edges. You might see a pattern here. Like uh, Essentially, uh, the what's happening in the background is that the gauge transformation of A involves a Laplacian of the gauge parameter. So that involves all these three edges here. And that's why it kills the dipole here and creates the di uh, two dipoles here. Next, you can do the same thing, keep repeating this. You can apply E to the IA here, and that moves the dipole here to these two dipoles, and apply E to the IA here, which moves the dipole from here to here. In the next step, when I apply E to the IA here and here, these two dipoles just go to the same edge with opposite orientation, so they just annihilate each other. Whereas when I apply the operator E to the IA here, this dipole is completely annihilated. So now uh, this, the product of all these E to the IAs, 
is the operator that moves the particle from this vertex to this vertex. So what I have demonstrated is uh, how a particle can move from I to I prime when there is a unique path between them. On the flip side, if the graph is two edge connected, which means uh, removing any edge doesn't uh, uh, leaves it connected, doesn't make it disconnected. In that case, uh, a particle is a fracton; it just cannot move anywhere. For example, in this graph, if I remove this edge, it becomes disconnected. Equivalently, there is a unique path between these two vertices here. So a particle here can uh, hop to this side here. On the other hand, uh, in this graph, removing any edge doesn't make it uh, disconnected. So on this graph here, uh, any particle on any vertex cannot move to any other vertex. So it's a fracton, right? This is not actually a very restrictive condition. It's actually very mild because any regular lattice that you can imagine uh, in any dimension uh, satisfies this condition. It's uh, they're all two edge connected. So when you place this model on uh, on any regular lattice, you have fractons in. It. Okay, let me summarize. Uh, so I discussed two exotic lattice models uh, where the spatial lattice is a general graph. Uh, it's not restricted to be any lattice, it can be anything. Uh, the peculiar features, the three important characteristics that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk are present in these models, and they're uh, very closely related to some well-studied notions in graph theory. So the first one is uh, the exotic global symmetries. They're, they're based on the Jacobian group of the graph. Uh, next, the ground state degeneracy of the, uh, the first model uh, is equal to the number of spanning trees or the complexity of the graph, and we know that it grows exponentially uh, in a large class of graphs. And finally, uh, the particles in the second model uh, behave like fractons whenever the graph is two edge connected. And one can show this using a graph theoretic version of uh, Abel Jacobi map. Now, while the uh, matter theory is not robust, uh, the gauge theory is robust. Uh, moreover, there are other robust models that we are currently working on and which will appear in the future uh, pretty soon, I guess. Uh, I just wanted to tease one of these models, uh, which uh, is a, uh, an isotropic model with line-ons, which can move in the Z direction. So I add another direction to the graph. So th there is a graph and there is a Z direction and the particles can move in the Z direction, but uh, they don't, they can't move in the uh, graph itself. Uh, it has a stabilizer uh, code kind of description where these are the uh, stabilizer terms. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. So I have two questions, both of which should be very simple to you. One is, um, what's the definition of the Jacobian group? You know, what are explicitly the groups for the simplest graphs like cyclic graph, uh, complete graph, etc.? That's first question. Second question is. I don't know too much about graph theory. So can you uh, use your theory to work on fractal lattice? Uh, that, that's, that's my two questions. So uh, with the first question, uh, uh, I can give you like explicitly how to define the Jacobian group of the graph if, if you're I think we have time to, so maybe let me do that. Uh, uh, so uh, for every uh, for the Laplacian operator, you can think of it as a matrix, right? Uh, like uh, n by n matrix, where n is the number of vertices in the graph. And uh, this uh, there is something called a Smith normal form of an integer matrix. It's kind of like a diagonalization, but not completely diagonalization because we use two different matrices on either side. Uh, but what it does is it gives you another integer matrix which is diagonal and has all these all the uh, integers here, uh, which by some property, uh, but the upshot is that the Jacobian group is essentially uh, the cyclic groups of uh, the product of cyclic groups based on the integers. Uh, yeah, uh, so it, it essentially takes this form here, and you can also explicitly work out what the uh, discrete harmonic functions are on the graph in terms of uh, these uh, the Smith normal form of this matrix. Uh, let me just uh, mention one thing. Yeah, in the case of a cyclic graph. Uh, you can uh, explicitly do this. The uh, the matrix R, the Smith normal form of the Laplacian, is given, takes this form. It has lots of ones and then an n and then a zero. The zero is here is what really gives the u one momentum symmetry part, and the n is what gives the z n or dipole symmetry part. 
and the ones just don't give anything. The Z1 is just trivial group. And you can do this for any graph, this procedure, and that gives you the explicit expression for the Jacobian group. Uh, for the other question, like, uh, I don't know, so far I've uh, worked only with like finite graphs. You, can, you might even be able to extend it to like infinite graphs. It does work on uh, regular lattices, but uh, I'm not sure about fractal lattices. I'm not sure it is. Yeah, so n here is a finite number. Sure, yeah, as long as it's like a finite graph, it's fine. Okay. Even infinite graphs, graphs are actually fine, but uh, there are some subtleties uh, associated okay. with them. Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I have a very, perhaps a very simple conceptual question. So, uh, um, do I understand correctly that graph ref, um, refers to something with a set of vertices and the links? So, uh, my question is, what um, was special about graph or rather than like a cell? You, you know, there is, can be zero cells, one cell, and two cells. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, for this model, uh, we don't need the higher skeleton, like one skeleton is enough. So that, that would be just an ordinary graph. Uh, you could also have multiple edges between two vertices, which is also allowed in like, I guess allowed in cellular decomposition, but fine. You could have higher skeletons, like uh, higher simplexes. And there are indeed notions of uh, Laplacian for these higher simplexes, but uh, I haven't worked on that. Perhaps you can write some kind of uh, this kind of model even on uh, such simplicial complexes. Can you guys take any continuum model to this? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Like uh, we don't know really. Like. Uh, so in the case of a cycle graph uh, that was done in our recent paper, we already there, like there are uh, several continuum limits that you can take, which all make sense. Uh, but uh, even when the graph is uh, as simple as like a torus, which is like very physical and nice for us, uh, there are lots of subtleties uh, in taking the continuum limit. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if there is a, uh, I, I'm sure that there is no unique continuum limit, but, uh, Identifying even one is kind of very hard in this problem. And that's something that we are working on. It'll appear in our papers. Thanks. There's a bit of a generic question, but to, to what extent um, are, are the results you mentioned on your summary slide model dependent? For example, I would imagine the equivalence between ground state degeneracy and complexity is specific to the Lifshitz model because of the property of the Laplacian, right? Yeah. And, and is there like more general principles that you can apply to generic models or? Uh, I'm not sure, like uh, whatever I said is specific to this model. I see, model. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. We have a question on Zoom, P please go ahead. Yeah, uh, you mentioned this uh, matter model is uh, unstable, but the gauge model is stable. So what do you mean by stable, unstable? And uh, maybe it's related to the previous question. That's uh, whether it's stable means uh, the ground state generally is stable against the arbitrary perturbation. Uh, is, is, is that the meaning? Yeah, uh, by uh, by robustness, I mean uh, whether the ground state degeneracy in this case or, or the symmetries of the theory, whether they're uh, stable under perturbations or not. So in the particular example of the, yeah, uh, in this model here, uh, the ground state degeneracy is not robust because we cannot add, uh, let, let's say we impose only the momentum symmetry and not the winding symmetry. Uh, then we can add some winding operators and that will generically lift the ground state degeneracy. And that's why this model is not robust. But, uh, but for the robust model, it does robust against the arbitrary perturbation or you still require uh, the graph theory to have certain kind of symmetry. Uh, uh, for in the robust models, like uh, the thing is there are no local operators uh, uh, that act non-trivially in the ground state space. And that, that's why it is uh, robust. Like in this case, we have okay. this mining and momentum operators, which you can add. But in the robust models, there is no local operator. 
I see. So any local operator will not lift ground state degeneracy. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's another question. Yeah. There's one more question by John. Sorry, maybe I missed this, but in your in your second gauge theory model, um, what what is the nature of the ground state? Is it non-degenerate? Uh, oh yeah, there, there is no ground state degeneracy in this model. Uh, it's non-degenerate. The spectrum is actually very trivial. Like there is only this U1 symmetry. So the states are just labeled by the charge on, under this U1 symmetry. That's it. Okay, thanks. I have a quick question. Uh, there are various generalizations of graphs that you could consider like multigraphs or hypergraphs. Do any of your, um, well, first of all, does the notion of the graph Laplacian extend to those graphs? And, and second of all, do your do your models extend to such graphs? So my model definitely extends to uh, graphs with multi-edges. Uh, essentially, uh, let me go back to that. So in the setup, I said here that I consider a simple graph, which means there is at most one edge between the vertices, but that's just for simplicity. You, you could do multiple edges, that, that's totally fine. And when you say hypergraph, it's essentially uh, uh, simply shear complex. Uh, this model in particular doesn't extend to that because it doesn't really use the uh, the higher simply shear data. Uh, but there are definitions of Laplacian operator even for higher dimensional simply, uh, simplexes. So uh, perhaps you can write some model similar to this, like on those uh, hypergraphs. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm curious if you looked at the dual graphs or the dual graphs relevant to uh, all. In this, question. yeah, in this model, the dual graph wasn't really relevant. Like, uh, for example, um, when 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 you talk about the self duality, uh, where, where is that? Yeah, when when we usually talk about the self duality, for example, in a compact boson. Uh, the dual field lives on the the like the dual link and the links, right? Not the sides. But in this model, the uh, the dual field, the phi tilde field, also lives on the sides. So we don't actually ever use the dual graph in this model. Yeah. I have one question. Yeah. So uh, could you go to the last slide, the summary slide? Okay. Uh, yeah. So here you are saying. Uh, you have other robust models based on this uh, uh, the, the the CN and isotropic model. Uh, so this is a CSS model. Like the terms are just yeah. Th these terms commute with each other, and and they are of like uh, X type and Z type in the yeah. in yeah. the lattice. So the V's here you can think of them as X, and the U's here you can right. think of Z's when it's Z two. So here I wrote it for Z and then yeah, yeah. Is there a way to uh, twist these models, like non CSS, for example, uh, intrinsically non CSS ones? That I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank Pranay.